Seriously, commit to it and get to it. Maybe you're in one. Maybe you don't go to it very often. Commit to it and get to it. You might not want to go, but you were saying, I am going to worship God. God is worth it. God is worth my, my, my praise. I'm going to ascribe to him glory, and I'm going to take my embodied self, and I'm going to take time out of my busy schedule, and I'm going to put myself into a living room, into a church building, into whatever it might be to say that this is more important than that. And I think that... Worshiping. Glorifying and enjoying God. Worship is a lifestyle that permeates every aspect of our lives. Worship is seen in how we manage our money, how we run our businesses, how we parent our kids, how we respond to people, and how we manage our dreams and ambitions. The heart of worship is a heart that seeks God's presence and enjoys God for who He is and all that He has done for us. Well, what a great way to start off a series on worship, amen? Come on. You know, we're jumping into our next rhythm, which is worshiping and glorifying and the idea of glorifying and enjoying God. And I don't think there's a better way than to actually do the things that that Jesus said, hey, do these things in the church, i.e. baptism, do these things in the church communion. And so we get to worship our God through different ways today. And our hope and prayer is that you would experience the presence of God, the reality that the actual God is real, God is here, God is moving, and hopefully you picked it up through the faith of these people saying yes to Jesus in this moment, identifying with the body of Christ. But if you don't know, today is actually Pentecost Sunday. Anybody know that? If you follow the liturgical calendar, which is actually a beautiful thing, if you've never followed that, I think you should. The church of years and hundreds and thousands of years old have been looking at this idea of the liturgical calendar, and today is Pentecost Sunday. What is Pentecost Sunday? Pentecost means 50, and basically it's 50 days after Easter that we celebrate when the Holy Spirit fell upon the the followers of Jesus in that upper room waiting for the Spirit to be poured out, and what did that do? That birthed the church. So what we are experiencing here today started in that upper room when the Spirit of God poured out upon those followers of Jesus. And you know what happened? They went down, they spoke in other tongues, they proclaimed the gospel, and 3,000 people, the Bible says, was added to their number in that one day. And that's Pentecost Sunday. So I figured, since we're talking about worship and not just about singing, Today, you know, the guy that sings up here most the time is going to really not talk about singing at all. That's a different conversation for a different time. I will say this, for some reason, God decided that his people would be a singing people. And um, if you don't like to sing, uh, I think you gotta figure that out. Um, (laughs) That's a different conversation and a different biblical study of why God would choose to use music and singing to declare praises to him, but we are a singing people. But today I'm gonna be talking about worship as a bigger thing than this. And so we're gonna experience some different ways. We experience baptism as worship. We're gonna be experiencing communion as worship. When you walked in and you gave someone a hug and you said a handshake, you looked at them and said, I'm glad you're here this morning. Like, we're giving God glory. We're ascribing to him the worth that is due his name and that is worship. But I figured we'd worship in a different way, and so for hundreds of years, the church has been doing liturgical prayers. It's part of the worship of the church, being capital C church, across denominations, across styles, and in our kind of style of church, we don't do that very often, but I wanted to bring one of those into this moment to actually do a call and response prayer. So there's going to be a part that the leader reads, and then there's going to be a part that we all read. So let's stand together, and let's worship God through these words And I'll read the leader part, and then you guys can join me as we read the all part. Holy Spirit, Lord, and giver of life, at the beginning of time, you moved over the face of the waters. You breathed into every living being the breath of life. Come, creator spirit, and renew the whole creation. Holy Spirit, voice of the prophets, you ignite men and women with a passion for your truth and through them call your people to the ways of justice and compassion. 
Come, spirit of righteousness, and burn in our hearts. Holy Spirit, spirit of Jesus, by your power, Jesus came to bring good news to the poor and release to those held captive. Come, spirit of freedom, and free us from the powers of sin and death. Holy Spirit, advocate, teacher, you speak to us of our Lord and show us the depth of his love. Come, spirit of truth, abide in us and lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, wind and flame, you filled disciples with joy and courage, empowering them to preach your word and to share your good news. Come, spirit of power, make us bold witnesses of your redeeming love. Holy Spirit, spirit of peace, you break down barriers of language, race, and culture, and heal the divisions that separate us. Come, spirit of reconciliation, and unite us all in the love of Christ. Holy Spirit, Lord and giver of life, at the close of the age, all creation will be renewed to worship you. Come, spirit of worship, and renew us in Jesus Christ that we would worship with all things, in all things, and through all things, amen. Amen, you can have a seat. Now, for some of you that might have reminded you of like, oh, I please, I don't wanna ever go to a church like that again. <laughs> for others of you that are like, wow, that's really Amazing, a different way of worship, a different call and response that you're engaged with what's going on in the room. You know, we, we, we desire to see worship as something greater than one facet. And that's really what God intended. God intended some things when it comes to worship. Another way that we see worship in, in expressed is through art. And, and one of the things that I wanna talk about is when, when you look at a piece of art or a piece of literature, Meaning always originates with the author. So if you're studying the Bible and you're looking at a passage of scripture, one of the things in biblical hermeneutics that you are supposed to do is to say, what is the meaning that the original author intended for that to mean? You can't just come out and be like, I don't know. I just think it means this, right? It means that, it means that. You know, that's what we do. If you ever stand in front and look at an abstract piece of art, what do you go? You go, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Do you see something in there? I don't know, I don't know what I see. You know, but if you could sit with an, an artist and you could say, what was the meaning? And then you go look at the little placard. You ever been in a museum? You go look at the placard and it, it helps you a lot by it says 101. You're like, I don't even know what that means, but that's the name of it, you know? It's just like, what, is, what are they meaning by this? And so when people worship through art, it's oftentimes it originates with the author or the artist's intention. So I want to show you a piece of art. I'm getting to my point. Who knows what this piece of art is? What's it called? Who's it by? Does anybody know the year? 1889. Good job. So this is one of the most famous pieces of art that I could probably put up here that you've probably recognized it, you've probably seen it, you've probably seen, you know, wallpaper, or I mean like on your phone, not on your house, I don't know who uses that anymore, but whatever, it's a different, different conversation. But wallpaper on your phone or your, you know, your desktop or whatever it might be. But this is a super famous piece of art. And people for a long time have been like, what's the meaning of Van Gogh's art here? You know, like I'm trying to figure it out. And people talk about his style and people talk about the kind of medium that he uses and people talk about these things. But I think sometimes people miss what really is going on. Now at this time, Van Gogh is sitting in an insane asylum in St. Remy, France. He's been going through 12 months of depression trying to figure out his life because he had a lot of things going on in his life. Oftentimes, Van Gogh gets kind of put as this crazy guy, the guy that cut his ear off, right? You know, you know what I'm talking about, right? But, but in this moment, what you need to realize is that Van Gogh had a deep, deep spirituality. And Van Gogh wanted to live his life completely set aside for the worship of God. He didn't even want to be an artist. 
He wanted to be a missionary. He wanted to be someone that was on mission, someone that was a worshiper first. But what happened was his father and his uncle said that there's no place for you. And so because of that was wounded deeply by people that he saw in the church as people to help him become the man that he wanted to be to impact people for the gospel around the world. And I'm probably painting a different picture of Van Gogh. You can go research it yourself, but this is true. So Van Gogh's sitting in an assail asylum and he's looking over this valley, but what is he doing here? Now you gotta understand that Van Gogh, if you're sitting with the the artist, and some of the writings that he wrote about this help us understand what it was, because it was in, is in Chinchin. That the yellow was oftentimes used as a, star, as a spark of the divine. And so he would paint yellow into moments, into the stars, into the galaxy. There's sparks of divine, this spirituality that is all throughout everything. And then you look down into the city and you see these sparks of divine, this idea of worship, this idea of God in the midst of the city, in these windows, and where is there no yellow? Can you see it? It's the church. Why? Because the church is the highest point in the city, which connects the heavenly to the people, but yet, what has been put out in Van Gogh's mind? The divine in the church. Now, when you start to hear about an artist's intention for a piece of work, now no longer that's like, oh, did he use oil? You know, like, what, what did he use to paint it? You're going, whoa, I had no idea. Like, my fourth grade teacher never told me that. You know, like, like this, is, this is what an artist's intention does. It allows you to see what the purpose of something is. Now, when we talk about worship, we're talking about this idea well, let me just read this. Colossians 1, 15 and 16 says this. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things, don't miss this, talking about artist's intention. You were a masterpiece, artist's intention. All things have been created through him and for him. Artist's intention, God's intention, that you were created by him and for him. That is why you were created, by him and for him. Revelation 4, 11 says, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created we were made for him. We were made for God, for his glory, in his image, as a reflection of his beauty. Our purpose is to bring him glory. It's simple yet profound. It's natural yet divine. We were made to worship. We were made to worship, to give God all glory, all honor, and all praise. Everybody worships something. I want to read this to you. Whatever captivates our heart's affection, our mind's attention, and our soul's ambition, it effectively has our worship. Let me read that again. Whatever captivates our heart's affection, our mind's attention, and our soul's ambition, it effectively has our worship. The English word worship comes from the Anglo-Saxon worship, which literally means to ascribe worth to something, to say you are worthy of all things. God, you are worth it all. You're worth my whole entire life. You're worth me getting wet in the front of people I don't even know. Like, God, you are worth it. You're worth me singing. You're worth me lifting my hands and going, ah, even though I don't sing. Like, you're worth it. God, you are worthy of all glory, honor, and praise. Worship is about encountering the reality and presence of God and reordering our priorities in response to who he is. Let me, let me read that again. If you don't hear anything I say, leave with this. Worship is about encountering the reality and presence of God and reordering our priorities, my, Jake's priorities, in response 
to who he is. I love this by William Temple. It's one of my favorite quotes on worship. He says this, to worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, to open the heart to the love of God, to devote the will to the purpose of God. All this is gathered up in that emotion which must, most cleanses us from selfishness because it is the most selfless of all emotions, adoration. So I just said that you were made to worship. You were made to worship which means you were made to live a life of selflessness, which is adoration. Because you cannot adore something and also elevate yourself. The way of worship is to say, God, you are worthy, not me. Yes, thank you for my identity in Christ and you see me as loved and accepted. I'm a son, I'm a daughter. I have every right to the things that you've given me. There's pro all promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. But at the end of the day, God, I, I give you glory. I give you honor, I give you praise. Psalm 29, one and two says, ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory that is due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. You were made to worship. You were made to give God glory. You were made to give God praise. You were made to say, guys, look at him. Let me give God glory, and what does it do? It draws you in, and what does that draw you in to do? Give God glory. What is the purpose of anybody that would ever step on this stage, and let's just talk about music and singing for a minute, that would either lead at a mic or behind a guitar? What is their one purpose? Their one purpose is to say, come with me as I give God glory, you join me, let's give God glory. That's it. That's why we have songs that we can sing together. That's why you don't just sit there, or you shouldn't be, and just watch us do what we do up here. It means that you engage. It means that you're going, yes, that lyric is what I need to sing right now. Uh, you know, that song, Pursue. Oh my gosh, it's so amazing, right? I will pursue this idea of worship to go like, yes. You might not know Allie and Paige, but you're going, I don't need to know you, but I'm singing the thing that thank you for singing the thing that I want to sing today. That's the role of a worship leader. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, well, so whatever whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So you're, you are made to worship, that your mission is to give God glory. Whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do you know how many times that the idea of occupation is tied to biblical values throughout scripture? Any guesses? How many? If you're here for a service, you can't yell out anything. <laughs> any, any thoughts? How many times throughout the New Testament, occupation is tied to this idea of spirituality? Anybody? Anybody have a guess? More. More. More than two. We'll start at 2,000. How many more? Five, over 5,000 times. The idea of occupation, Jesus uses it, and it's tied. Why? Because your work is your worship. I feel like oftentimes we go Monday through Saturday and we're like, ah, I just need to get to worship. Hey, I'm not gonna get it wrong. This is amazing. And there's things that God does in a room, time and space like this set aside that cannot be done on your own. It's, it's true. That cannot be done on your own. But your work is worship. Whatever you do, I don't care what you do. You pack boxes you talk to people for a living, you sell homes, you work in the medical field, you raise kids, whatever you do, you do it unto the glory of God. You give him praise with it. And if that's your worship, then you're going, Sunday's rad because it's a different kind of worship, not because it is my worship. Does that make sense? Sunday's amazing because I get to see my friends and we get to drink coffee and we get to come together and we get to be led in worship. And you probably don't have this at home, I'm guessing, not. But you know, like there's a stage and there's people and we're leading in worship and it's an amazing thing and we're coming together and God's doing something unique, getting bap seeing baptisms happen. But this is just a different aspect of my worship, not all my worship. 
Simon Ponsby says this, worship is not limited to singing songs, but is a life poured out in holiness, obedience, service, almsgiving, mission, sharing the gospel with the lost, sharing our bread with the poor, sharing our lives with one another. I believe God receives glory by the very birth of an infant, by bees making honey, by husband and wife making love. When the painter paints, the singer sings, the architect designs, the teacher teaches, the athlete competes. Worship in song, in verbal praise, is one part, a significant part of worship, of glorifying God, but not the only one. Worship, we were made for it. So it's not just if we worship, but I guess the question I have is what do we worship? It's not if, we were designed, we were made, we all were made to worship. But it's not if we worship. Now, now what do we worship? There's really only two choices. We worship God or we worship something or someone else. Something or someone else. There's really only two choices. And there's a great story um, out of Exodus where the people of God, right, we understand throughout scripture this whole idea of idolatry. Now what is idolatry? Is it just because they made something? No, idolatry is this idea that God said worship me, I am the God, you should worship me, and they go no, I'm gonna worship something else. And I'm gonna put something else in that place of worship and that throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, specifically the Old Testament, is talking about idolatry. So when you hear that people are falling into idolatry, it's about worship. It's about misdirected worship. You were designed for this in this misdirection. And Exodus 32 says this. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, now you gotta understand that Moses was going up to the mountain. God said, I wanna meet with you. I wanna, I wanna give you the actual words, my words, Yahweh, their God, my words. And I wanna, Moses, come to the top of the mountain. Number one, the people were afraid to go as well. So they said, we'll stay here. Um, come to the top of the mountain. I'm gonna give you my words and you take them back down to the people so they can know how to worship me. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing. Bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf. Fashioning it with a tool, then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord, right? He's setting up a worship service. He's going, we got a God, now let's do a service. Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in every reverie. Then the Lord said to Moses, go down because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become, what? Corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them. What did he command them? Worship me. Worship me and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. And we look at that story, we're like, you guys are crazy. The guys on the mountain, like you guys know the story. The guys on the mountain, Moses is up on the mountain seeing God, hearing from God, the actual voice of God, actually chiseling in, right? You know, tablets, you know this? You've seen the movie? Um, you know, like he's going to come down the mountain with the very words of God for the worship of his people. That's what he's doing. And in this moment, because things aren't going as they want, things aren't going as they thought they should go, things aren't going as they think they should be going, what do they do? They set up a God. They form it with their own hands. They make a calf and they set up a worship service to sacrifice to it and do all the things that God has said for them to do to only him to this calf. And you read that story or you listen to that story and you're like, that is crazy. But you know what we do? I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't have a calf in my backyard. <laughs> and you don't either. But you know what we worship? Us. We worship us. 
You worship you. And so often, it's not about if we worship, but what are we worshiping? What is the object of your worship? And I looked at myself in the mirror as I was prepping for this. I'm like, you know what? You know what the biggest idol is in my life? Me, Jake. I am the biggest idol of worship. It's not my kids. It's not my wife. It's not my job. It's me. If it has to do with my kids, it's because of me. If it has to do with my wife, it's because of me. If it has to do with my job, it's because of me. But it always comes back to me. And I don't know if you know this, but we have a culture that is all about you do you. You've heard that? It's from the pit of hell. Excuse me. It is. It is. As Jesus followers, as people that have said we were made to worship, our only focus our only fix is Jesus. That we would worship God, we would give him glory and him alone, and him alone. We have to make God the point of our worship, that we'd say everything else has to move, everything else has to go away, and I will fix my eyes on Jesus. I will gaze, I will describe glory, I will give honor, I will give praise to nobody. Nobody but God. Nobody but God. So we were made to worship. It's not if we worship, but what we worship. And once we understand who we should be worshiping, which is God and God alone, we have to make worship a priority. We must make worship a priority. Richard Foster, who wrote a lot of books, a few books, but it's kind of one of the leaders on the idea of dis disciplines for spiritual formation. He says this, if the Lord is to be Lord, right? When we say, God, you are Lord of Lords. God, be the Lord of my life. You're saying basically, <laughs> you're in charge, I'm not. You're saying you are Lord, therefore nobody else or no other thing is Lord. And so if the Lord is to be Lord, worship must have priority in our lives. The divine priority is worship first, service second. I've heard people say it like this. There'd be no need for evangelism conferences, no need for discipleship conferences, no need for any of that stuff if the people of God would truly worship God. Why? Why do I say that? Of course, we can get better at all these things. Because if we truly understood what does it mean to worship God, you would be like, Hey, neighbor, this is my God. He's so awe-inspiring. I'm giving him glory. Hey, by the way, you should probably know this guy. You know what Jesus did in my life? I'm a worshiper first. I serve God second. What? Because if you truly worshiped God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that those things would naturally flow from a life of worship. You would be opening the scriptures. You'd be opening the scriptures and going, God, I worship you. I want to know you. I want to be transformed by you. But you would be doing these things, that you would be leading people to Jesus, that you would be walking in relationship with one another in small groups, in large groups, sharing the message of Jesus with your friends and family, i.e. discipleship. We would make, if we made worship a priority, worship is our response to what we value most. So I guess I have to ask you, what do you value? Because once you know where your value is, I can point that's your worship. It's very simple. Jake, what is my value? My value is this, this, or this. Oh, that's, that's what I'm worshiping. It's very simple. Worship is our response to what we value most. You know, there's this interesting passage in Luke 10, and, and many of you probably know it, and um, it's a beautiful passage because it really is about making worship a priority. Luke 10 says this, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. 
Now look what Jesus says. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. In this moment, I don't think Jesus is talking about those that work and those that don't. Jesus is talking about one thing and that is a worshiper. That's it. That's it. It doesn't matter if you are an extrovert or an introvert, if you are a busybody, if you're a not, if you're a task person, if you're a not. He's not talking about any of that. This is a story about a worshiper. This is a story about somebody that said, I'm choosing to worship God and I am going to make it a priority. Why is this time that we have here together called a worship service? Why is that? Well, we sing together, we open up the scriptures, baptisms happen, yeah, but you know what? Let me just, let me just say it in this light. I think the greatest thing in our day and age that this is a worship service is because you are saying by your, your embodied self being in a room for an allotted amount of time that this is more important than that. Whatever it is. You're saying, I only have X amount of time in my life. We only have the same X amount of hours, but I am actually saying with my embodied self sitting in a chair, in a room with hundreds of people, that this time right now is worthy. God is worthy of it when I could be doing all sorts of other things. And that's not a religious statement. That's just the truth of priority. I've been thinking a lot about our kids and discipling my kids. And here's the thing. I think we need to be discipling worshipers. We need to be raising up worshipers, not behavior modified little people. (laughs) I'm serious. The people that we look to in the scriptures that are worshipers were a mess. But they always had a return to Jesus. They always had a return to God. They were always about repentance and trying to figure out, man, God, I'm following you. But they were worshipers, which means that Jesus was worth it, that God was worth it. You know, I'm watching young adults fall away from the church. The the stats are actually mind-numbing. How many? Like 90% of young adults fall away from the church. When they leave high school, they do not come to church. Why? Well, there's a lot of reasons. I think one of them, as I've been going through this message, in my own heart, is because God is not worth it. And I wonder if they don't learn that at home. Just saying. Do they learn that in the Schween home? That we make a priority. It doesn't mean you don't play sports. It doesn't mean you don't do things. But we make it a priority to set time aside. That we go, you know what? This is greater than that. This is more important as the worshipers of God than that. Hey. Next week, my kids might not be here because they're playing sports. So what I'm just saying is like, what, what I'm saying is like, I understand culture. I understand what's going on. But at the end of the day, if your kid goes to a youth program, whether it's Arden or somewhere else, and they have a sports thing that backs up to it, get them there. Get them there. You're saying with your embodied self that, you know what? Life is busy. Oh, no. Come on. We live a pretty bougie life in America, y'all. I'm just saying, because your heart, it's a little hard to go from one thing to the next. Oh, it's tough. (laughs) I'm serious, right? We have a great, we live in America. It's a great country. We have a lot, hey, yeah. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. I think we're just kind of weak when it comes to being worshipers. I watch my friends around the world. I'm like, man, they, they get it. They get it. They understand it. So what would it look like if we raised our kids to say that Jesus was worth it? When they go off to college and they're trying to find a church, I can't find a church, but you know what? I'm gonna make a commitment to have my embodied self in the church community. Even if I can't find it, I'm gonna try to find it because I'm a worshiper, not because I like the pastor or I like the worship or man, I might go look for a different one or man, I'm not connecting here, not connecting there, but I am saying with my embodied self that this is more important than that. Hey, if you're in a small group, commit to it and get to it. Like that? That's good, that should be our slogan, (laughs) right? Seriously, commit to it and get to it. Maybe you're in one, maybe you don't go to it very often. Commit to it and get to it. You might not wanna go 
but you were saying, I am gonna worship God. God is worth it. God is worth my, my, my praise. I'm gonna ascribe to him glory, and I'm gonna take my embodied self, and I'm going to take time out of my busy schedule, and I'm gonna put myself into a living room, into a church building, into whatever it might be to say that this is more important than that. And I think that that's the kind of people that God is looking for, worshipers. Worship is about encountering the reality and presence of God and reordering our priorities in response to who he is. One of the greatest things as we conclude here is that we have the opportunity to take communion together. And why do I say this? Well, it was put into place so that it would be a deep, worshipful expression. This is not just a reminder, oh yeah, Christ died on the cross. Although it can be that, but you know what it is? It's a deep, worshipful reminder of that we are fixing our eyes on Jesus and once again, this, there is life in this blood. There is life that has been given to me through the work of the cross, through the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, that there's life in this. And once again, I'm coming to the table and something mysteriously supernatural happens when we go to the table and we take the juice and we take the bread. In this moment, in a worshipful heart, you're saying, Jesus, I'm fixing my eyes on you. I'm taking you and putting you at the rightful place because I'm gonna ascribe to you all glory, all honor, and all praise, and everything else has to fade. Nothing can have that spot. And we're gonna sing a song that says nothing else. I don't want anything else. I would just encourage you, would you allow that song to go to the depths of your heart? Allow it to go into your mind. Think through the words. Maybe for some of you, you're gonna lift your hands or for some of you, you're just gonna sit and think. But would you engage with the singing, the worship that's gonna happen from stage through song? And I love it. There's a confession moment. It says, God, I'm sorry when I've done these things. Basically, when I've said, God, you're not the sinner anymore. God, I'm sorry. I just want you. And today we have communion. We're back to crackers and juice, like not the compartmentalized things. So you can come up and it's open juice, just FYI. So if you do that, it's going to dump everywhere. Um, but we also have gluten-free or packaged in the, in the middle, but we have it available. And I'd encourage you because it's open, just take some time. You don't got to go quick. Don't move quick. Let this moment, don't miss this moment. Allow these words, allow you to enter in. And then feel free at some point during this song to come forward and grab the bread, the juice, and take it back to your seat. And I'll come back up and lead us through that time. So Jesus, we just want you. God, we fix our eyes on you, the author and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before you endured the cross. God, nothing else will do. Nothing else will do.